Hi, I'm Jay Oza. I'm here in front of the Newark uh, Public Library. I'm about to give a talk on how to get a good high paying job today. You know, getting a good high paying job is very hard. In order to get a good high paying job, you need to focus on three things. One, you got to have a strong message and a compelling narrative. Second, you got to demonstrate you have relevant skills and how you can apply those skills to solve complex business problems. And third, you got to package yourself so that you make it easier for the interviewers to understand who you are, what you have, and how you can add value to them. If you do that, not only you're going to stand out, but you're more likely to walk away with the job offer. Good luck, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. So my objective uh, this afternoon is very simple. I'm going to share some of my ideas, tips, and techniques so that you can get a good high paying job today. Now, whenever you watch the news, you hear about how low the unemployment rate is, like 3.7, everybody out there is getting jobs. But the one thing they're not telling you is those are not necessarily good high paying jobs. Good high paying jobs are much harder to get. These are the type of jobs that the companies view as strategic. That's going to help them grow and scale in some cases. So that's what this talk is all about. I'm going to cover some of the uh, ideas that I've learned from my personal experience, as Leslie mentioned, worked in the industry for 25 years. But the other thing is that I've been coaching people. So I coach people who go for executive level jobs. These are like one or two la levels below the CEO. So even though you might say, well, I'm not an executive, but the techniques still apply. When you're interviewing, they want you to bring something to the table. Doesn't matter because today you could be entry level job or you could be an executive. You're hired to do one thing, solve problems. These are complex business problems that you have to solve. So like one thing I say that today, you know, you not only have to talk the game, not only have to walk the game, but you got to run the game. By that I mean speed is of the essence now. It's not enough to just say I can talk the game and walk the game. You got to demonstrate that you're going to be able to come in and solve the problems quickly. Otherwise, the company is not going to do well and you're not going to do well. So keep that in mind. So what I'm going to cover is kind of start at the high level. The main thing you need to know because there's always that one slide that has to give you the overall picture. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go peel the onion. And I'm going to show you exactly how you do it. So if anything here sounds like, wow, this is too difficult, I will send you the slides, review it. And if you have any questions, certainly contact me. Because it's very important because all the stuff that I'm going to cover here, it's all been tested and it works. But one thing I will tell you, there's a lot of work involved here. It looks simple, but there's a lot of work here. 
So when you look and say, like, oh, this is easy, I can do it, you actually have to do it. Because <laughs> if you don't do it, it's not going to work. Okay? You got to be able to internalize this and be able to repeat it and say it. And if you can say it at home on your own or with uh, somebody that you're working with, uh, a loved one, then you're going to be able to do it when you're in front of an interview. Okay? So before I continue, let me thank you all for coming. I know this is uh, one of the hardest things to do, to take the first step to come and listen to a talk like this. My job is to give you some ideas that you can take so that you can take that second step. And then you're going to take that third step. And when you take the third step, good things happen. So congratulations for taking the first step. Now it's my job to make you take that second step. And if you take that second step, then you're on your own to take that third step. And if you do that, you'll do well. So thank you for coming. I want to thank uh, Ms. Leslie Khan here and the Newark Public Library for organizing this event. I know how much planning and coordination is required and having this nice setup here in this uh, room that we're giving this presentation. So thank you very much uh, for your time and effort putting this uh, event together. Uh, lastly, I want to thank the taxpayers in Newark for supporting this library because without their support, we couldn't have this event where I can come and give a presentation and you can come and listen to me and create a stronger community. So it's very important that we thank the taxpayers for their support. Now, one thing before I continue, I just want to point out this, and I'm going to cover this later. As you can see, this is sort of my tagline. This is like how I introduce myself, like, you know, who am I? I guide people thrive on high stakes stage. What does that mean? So what I do is I help people when they're going for these executive level jobs. And it doesn't have to be executive level. It could be any job. That's a high stakes. For most of us, that's our Super Bowl. Because decisions are going to be made that's going to either you know, change our life or we're going to have to work harder to, to get those jobs. So this is high stakes when you are interviewing. Also, it's high stakes when people are going for sales deals. That's high stakes. Either they're going to win the deal or lose the deal. And the third thing I help people with is when they're going and giving a talk, like the talk that I'm giving, but much higher stakes in front of a lot of people. And I coach them so that they can give a very good talk. And uh, it resonates with the audience. So that's what I mean by high stakes. High stakes means either you're going to win or lose. That's it. That's high stakes. So when you go for a job interview, you're either going to get the job or you're not going to get the job. That makes it high stakes. Okay? In any situation, when you're interacting with people, there are three questions that we are always asking. And this is something I picked up from that motivational, that great motivational speaker, Les Brown. He says there are three questions that we're always asking. Who are you? What do you have? And why should I care? That's our way of sniffing people out. You know, we're not like dogs. If you see dogs in park, they're always sniffing each other out to see, hey, is this a, a, somebody that I can get along with? That's how they greet each other, right? What we do is like, hey, I met this person. Hey, who are you? What do you have? Why should I care? These are the three questions we ask when we interact with people. And guess what? These are the three questions that an employer is asking when you're interviewing. So you've got to know who you are, what you have, and why should they care? The burden is on you to address that. Because if you don't, it's your fault. OK, so you've got you to nail this. Who are you? What do you have? Why should I care? This is the main slide, because now I'm going to go into details. So if at the end, you get nothing out of this talk, and if somebody says, hey, what did you get out of that talk you attended this afternoon? This is what you tell them. I learned something important, that in any interaction, whether it's meeting people, meeting uh, strangers, or you're networking, or you're going for a job, I've got to nail these three questions. Who am I? What do I have? And why should they care? OK, now what we're going to do is, how do you do it when you're looking for a job? So now we got the main idea. But when it comes to a job, how do you do this? Three ways. The first thing you need, you've got to have a message and a compelling narrative. And we'll go into this in more detail. Because when you talk to people and you have no message, they can't understand who you are. So you've got to have a message and a narrative. By narrative, I mean not your life story, but 
something you can cherry pick out of your background that amplifies your message. That's what I mean. So if you have a message that uh, I make people's problem disappear, let's say that's your message. I'm sure Ms. Khan does that all the time. Then your narrative should be, look at all the people who come who have all these issues with their careers, learning about computers, and they are very happy when, they, when I can make their problems disappear. So that would become her narrative, okay? So then the second thing is, now you're looking for a job, so that's who you are. The second one is, what do you have? In order to get a good, high-paying job, you gotta have skills. Goes without saying. If you don't have skills, I can't help you. <laughs> this presentation is not going to help. You've got to have skills. So you've got to do an inventory of what skills you have. And the amazing thing is you have a lot more skills than you think you do, and we'll cover that. Okay? And then once you identify the skills you have, now you have to take those skills, apply it to solve some complex business problem. That's what it's all about. Because if you cannot solve problems, then why would you hire somebody who can't solve your problem? No. So that's how you have to look at it. I got to go in and be that problem solver that employer is looking for. Because if I can solve the problem, I can be young, I can be old, I could be a woman, I could be a man, I could be anybody. They will hire me because that's what it's all about. Nobody wants to hire people who can't solve problems because they're not going to grow. They're not going to scale. So keep that in mind. Don't start letting that inner message from your head come to you and say, hey, you're no good, you're too old, you're this, that. No. You got to grab that and say, no, I can do all of this because I have skills and I, have, I know how to solve complex business problems. The third thing is, why should they care? Now, this is important. You got to create a package and we will cover that because if you're not well packaged, then you're making it difficult for people to understand who you are. So when you package it, they don't have to think too hard. Because if you're making them think too hard, the answer usually is no. So we'll cover that, okay? So at this point, you got 90% of the talk. So at this point, 90% of the talk is done. Now we're gonna go into the nitty gritty details on how do you do this. But before I move on <clears throat> to those three, the core part of my talk about who you are, what you have, and why should you care, I just want to cover this part, mindset, because this is the third in a series of talk that I have given on this topic. When I gave this talk the first time, I focused exclusively on how somebody can land an executive level job. A lot of the questions I got asked, the first part, it didn't resonate. What they really were interested in, some of the tips and techniques on interviewing and that. So then the second talk that I gave focused on that, like resume, uh, phone interviews and face-to-face -face interviews and people like that. But then I got questions saying, but what if, uh, like you Janice, what if I'm, I want to get back into the market? Or somebody who's already working for many years, but I want to see what else is out there. And I'm already comfortable, life's great, but you know what? I want some challenge because things can happen any day. You can have a good job, and it can disappear quickly. Believe me, it has happened to me <laughs> quite a few times, so I know what that feels like. So I said, let me spend a couple of slides on just addressing this thing. What is the mindset you need? So I'm gonna go through one or two slides on the mindset, so that'll kinda help you before you go into the market. You know you're pretty clear on the mindset you need to be successful, okay? So the mindset today, the way I see it is, there's a job mindset, there's a career mindset, and then there's a purpose mindset. Now, most of the people have a job mindset. Now, that's okay, because people need to pay the bills, and they get defensive, because you need paycheck. But that puts you on defense, and there's no guarantee today, just because you have a job today, you'll have that job tomorrow. A lot of people with the job mindset are just doing enough to keep the job. That's defense. And you know, you gotta score points, right? In football, you gotta score points to win. So you gotta start thinking about how do I go from a job mindset to a career mindset? And a career mindset means you're gonna do above and beyond what others are not willing to do so that you get ahead in your career. You get ahead. So career is about getting ahead. And if you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, then you're gonna get what they're getting. And when companies have layoffs or 
uh, they get acquired or a new boss comes, you know, they want changes. So this is sort of your insurance to protect against that. So you want to get a little bit on, you have a, to have a career mindset. But a career mindset also can get, uh, can be uh, destructive if that's all you're focusing on. So at some point, once you're saying, okay, I, got, I have a good job, I've got a career, but I don't have a purpose. And it's the purpose that you need that's going to make you happy in life. Purpose is important. This is my purpose. I like what I do. So that makes me happy. So I'm going to focus on that. How do you find your purpose? So I don't want people to feel like, oh my God, he's talking about purpose and I don't even have a job right now. No, the first thing you do is get that job. But once you get the job, I don't want you to rest. I want you to start thinking about, hey, I need to learn new skills so I can have a good career. And then once you got your career under, uh, uh, going well, then think about how do I really get a purpose in life so that I'm happy and I can live well into my old age and feel productive. Because that's what we want. Let's face it. We're going to live long. With all this medical technology, we're going to live into our 90s, 100s. Some of them, you know, women live really long nowadays. So what are you going to do? You're going to be productive. So start thinking about purpose. And how do you do that? Okay. So there is this Japanese concept called ikigai. Not sure if anybody is familiar with this, but it's a very good concept, and this is how they think. It's a reason for being. And what it is is that if you want a purpose, there are four circles, right? Four different things. When they overlap, that gives you that sweet spot known as ikigai, reason for being. So for example, you're, ask, you're answering like, what do you love to do, okay? You don't want to work on something that you don't love, otherwise you're going to burn out pretty quickly. And the second thing is, what are you good at? You have to ask yourself, what am I good at? Because if you're not good at it, then you're not going to do well. So you've got to know what you're allowed to do, what you're good at. Then you have to ask yourself, what does the world need? Does the world need what you're doing? Let's say that's yes, and then can you get paid for it? And if you got yes for all of them, you got yourself your purpose. And once you got your purpose, you're set. You're going to be happy. You're going to have a very fulfilled life. And you're going to live long and be very productive. So keep that in mind that this is a way, this fancy word called ikigai. It's a Japanese word, but I like it. Out of all the things I've seen, this one makes a lot of sense to me. So what I'm doing, this is my ikigai. I like giving talks. I think I'm good at it, and I work hard improving this skill. Uh, I can get paid for it. I think the world does need somebody who can take something complex and simplify it. And I love doing this. So this is my ikigai. And I hope that you take this slide and ask yourself, what is it that you love? What is the, something that you do the world needs? What are you good at and what you can get paid for? That will give you purpose. And this is something you can do either now or once you get a job. Get a job and then ask yourself, do I, is this my ikigai? so you can work towards the purpose mindset. Okay, and the last thing is, when you are looking for a job, there are two words that you wanna keep with you. It's growth and scale. When companies, and this again, we're talking about good, high paying job. Companies hire you and they pay you well if you're part of their growth strategy. So if you, let's say, work at AT&T or Verizon or any of these big companies, there's like a Prudential or some, there's Audible right next door. Audible is a growth company, right? They're growing, they're right next door. And what they want to do is grow. There's incremental growth, you want to grow little by little by little. Typically, you know, when a company gets big, they can't grow too fast, right? Because they've already gotten so big. So they want to grow. If they're looking at hiring you, you got to show them how are you going to help them grow? Because if you're not helping them grow, then why would they want to hire you? So you've got to keep that word. Here's what I can do for you to help you grow. But sometimes you have startup companies, small companies, they have to scale. They've got to get big real fast. Because if they don't get fa big fast, then they're going to get knocked out. So two words, growth and scale. Okay, and that's why I have X plus N. You don't have to worry about the math part. So is this clear? So this is the mindset. So we covered the mindset now. Now we're ready to get into how do you answer those three questions? Who are you? What do you have? And why should somebody care? Very important, message and narrative. The most important thing in any situation you find, you look around, 
if somebody doesn't have a, a, a person with a message and a narrative usually beats the person that doesn't have a good solid message and a narrative. And to give you an example that we're all familiar with is our current president. You can hate him, but you can learn something from him too. <laughs> and here's what you can learn from him. He had no experience. I had more experience than him. I used to be on the Board of Education, okay? He had no experience. He had a message. He said that he's going to make America great again. And then he created this narrative, said, my father loaned me a million dollars, which I paid him back with interest. My father was so scared to go and compete with the big boys, but not I. I went into Manhattan, started competing with the big boys, and I built some of the greatest property, and now I'm worth $10 billion. And people bought it. He tied his message to his narrative. And people said, wow, but you don't have any experience. Well, look at this. I went from $1 million to $10 billion. Is that the kind of person you want to run this country? And people said, yeah, we'll take, we'll take a chance on this guy. <laughs> and he's the president. So what I'm saying is that a message and a narrative is very important. Do not think, never go into a battle without a message and a narrative. It's, it's because you're not going to resonate. Because people don't want to think too hard. And especially now when people have so many things going on with so many distractions that a message just penetrates very quickly and a narrative amplifies that message. Okay? Another example of how powerful a message and a narrative is and again, this is not necessarily, I'm going to go into a particular how it, you can apply it when you're looking for a job, but just another example to kind of make sure to sh emphasize how important message and narrative is, is the Mueller investigation that we just had recently. That was a two-year investigation to look into uh, Russian interference and see if there was any kind of conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russian uh, intelligence. And... Mueller, when he completed it, he, he, he submitted a 448-page report known as the Mueller report, right? But before he submitted the Mueller report, there was already a message that was already there, and there was a narrative. The message that, that Donald Trump created was there was no collusion, no obstruction, no nothing. So that was the message. The narrative that he created was, look, I basically busted my butt trying to fix this country and I ran for this election and I won it fair and square and now the Democrats and the established Republicans are, don't like it and they're vindictive and they're basically engaging in a witch hunt. So that was the narrative. Like it or not, that was the narrative, okay? And you know what happened? The result is there's no public support for impeachment. There's not going to be an impeachment. So again, the message and the narrative not only works in politics, it better work when you're looking for a job because it does work. So let's say you are working and you're doing, could be anything, but let's say you have worked for 10 years, 20 years, and what you've done is provide customer experience. So that's your work for 10 to 20 years. That's what you have been doing. And let's say you have been documenting it different ways, such as writing blog posts, videos, and LinkedIn. So you're establishing your credibility that you know something about what a good customer experience looks like. And the reason I bring up customer experience is because today companies win by providing better customer experience than their competitors. Customer experience is something that we all have to be good at because that's how it works. Competition is fierce and whoever provides better customer experience, customers will gravitate towards them. And you cannot take customers lightly because there are companies out there that provide excellent customer experience like Amazon, like Apple, like uh, Nordstrom. So people know what a good customer experience looks like. And if you're not doing it, you're, you're not going to survive for too long. So then the, the message that you would create, so let's say you have all that. So what would be the message? This is what I would use. If somebody asked me, what do you do? I deliver excellent customer experience. That's my message. And my narrative in the resume would be a one page where I would show them the narrative. Like it, and this is where people say, well, you can't include your past experience. Like, let's say I started out working at McDonald's. Now, typically, I don't put what I had done when I was in high school. But if I want to create a narrative, that experience at McDonald's becomes extremely important. So I'm showing some kind of an arc that when I worked at McDonald's, the only customer experience that I was engaged in was give us a nice smile, fulfill the order, and saying, you know, thank you. 
That was the start of my providing good customer experience. Then I learned more when I took on the next job. So you see you're creating a narrative. You're not bringing things that are not related to that. It has to be related to this, customer experience. So the narrative has to amplify your message. And if you do that, and this is something you have to do upfront in any job interview or anybody you meet, because if you don't do that, the other person doesn't know who you are. Okay? So this message and narrative addresses that first question, who are you? Okay, so now we're ready to move to the next step. And that comes down to skills and problem solving. Because today, you need lots and lots of skills. And you have to keep on adding more and more skills in order to be gainfully employed and to get ahead and have a good career. Because you never know what skills you'll need. So you have to be very strategic in how you approach skills. So like if you're taking a computer science course, you want to take that course if it's going to get you a job. Otherwise, you're wasting a lot of time. So you take, pick a skill, anything you're learning, it has to turn into a skill. Like I, my son is in high school right now, and I tell him that every class you take, not sure how effective it is, but I'm trying, find out what is the real core skill that you're learning when you take a course. Otherwise, all you're going to get is a grade. Do you want a grade or do you want a skill? Today, you've got to be very skills focused. You can get an A, but then let's say I take a course on Shakespeare. Hey, I got an A in Shakespeare or British literature. But you know what the real skill is? If you have to write a lot of papers, now you've developed writing skills. That writing skill is very important. So don't say I just got an A. What was the skill that you learned that you can apply? Because if you know how to write, then you're golden because writing skill is going to be important forever. You need to know how to communicate, and writing is one way to do it. So what I'm saying is that any time you're in, before you ask yourself, is this, is this something I should spend money taking this course, find out what is the core skill that I am going to learn. And if you can do that, then take it. Because otherwise, you're going to be disappointed. Because you're going to take a course, you'll work hard, but now you can't get a job. Because you can't cl clearly convince somebody that you really have that skill. So be very strategic around skills. But skills is something that a lot of people talk about, but they don't quite understand what really skills means. There are three types of skills, okay? And they're all kind of integrated. And they are, the way I look at it is, there's access skills, very important. Then there are bridge skills. These are typically like soft skills, like communication, collaboration, negotiation. But then there are hard skills. These are like, I call it money skills. This is where you actually, actually have to do the work. Like if you're writing code, or you're doing SEO uh, for marketing purposes, or accounting, marketing, sales. These are like delivery skills. Like me giving a talk here, this is what I have to deliver. And I asked Ms. Khan that I'm going to come and give a talk. This is what I have to deliver. I have to first get access through the maze here at uh, New York Public Library that got me access to Ms. Khan. And then I have to use my communication skills to say, hey, I can add value to people who would attend it. So as you see, I integrated all three skills, access, bridge, and money. Now, these are three skills that you need when you're looking for a job, when you have a job, and when you're looking to get ahead. So they're not like separated. They all work together. So for example, I'm on my own. The most important skill for me is this, access. Access is the most important skill because I'm already giving this talk. I think I can handle this part well too, communication and, and I can, I'm delivering this talk. But if I don't get access, I can't do any of this. So look at skills in a different way. Now access skill could be you can belong to a church. There's certain access you're getting because you belong to a church. How are you leveraging that? Are you letting people know who you are? Do they know who you are? Well, if they're not, if they don't know who you are, then you gotta let them know who you are. You have access, but they don't know who you are. So you gotta let them know who you are, you gotta use your bridge skills and saying that here's what I can do for people. Then they'll connect you to somebody. Or you could be in a volunteer organization. That gives you certain access because you are volunteering. Are you leveraging that? you got to, like for example, I go for a walk in park, and everybody I meet, 
I let them know, I'm going to give a talk in Newark. I'm going to be giving talk next week in Middletown. So access is very important. So skills, don't view this as like, oh, I know how to code. No, that's just one part, one leg of a stool. It's, there are three legs here. Access, bridge, and money. Okay? And if you understand this, then you will understand how to leverage your skills strategically. And then once you do that, then you have to apply these skills for what is really important. You have to solve complex business problems. And according to the, the World Economic Forum, the number one skill that companies are going to be looking for in 2020 is problem solving. Problem solving. Not only you have to solve problems individually, because if you can't solve problems individually, then how are the companies you're working for are going to solve the problems for their customers? So it's not just individual, it's also institutional. Like, New York Public Library has to solve problems for its clients when they come in. They have to provide all kinds of classes, books, all of it. There are constantly problems they have to solve to be relevant so that more and more people will come in. And like Leslie Khan invited me to give a talk, she basically, by inviting me, is trying to solve a problem that she sees that the, the community here has, which is how do they get a good high paying job? So this is how you have to think. What is the problem that you're solving? So I'm going to give you two examples of uh, people that really get this. One is this uh, woman that you probably have heard of. Her name is Carly Fiorina. And Carly Fiorina was uh, recently well known because she ran for president. And uh, if you remember, Donald Trump had made some derogatory comments about her looks. And she had a real good moment in one of the debates in 2016. But prior to that, she was a CEO of uh, one of the, the high-powered women of Hewlett Packard. So she was a CEO of Hewlett Packard. And she just came out with a book recently, and she was on a tour, and she was on a, one of the podcasts, and one of the, the host of the podcast asked her, so Carly, when did you think you were going to become a CEO? And she thought for a second and said, the day I got the offer. And the uh, host was kind of taken back. The day you got the offer? And she said, yes, because I never looked at my career as trying to become a CEO or any position. I just focused on solving problems. She started out as a secretary and moved all the way to become a CEO. And she said that most people run away from problems. Not I. I ran towards problems. And when you solve a problem, then you get a bigger problem to solve. And the titles and money and all that, that takes care of it. So it's not like, hey, I want to become a CEO. Don't become a CEO like that. You got to earn it. And the way you earn it is this. You got to solve. And if the problem is big enough, then you get to be the CEO of a big company like Hewlett Packard. The other person uh, is uh, the current CEO of uh, Microsoft, Satya Nadella. And Satya Nadella, he went and uh, when he got his degree from University of, he didn't go to Ivy League school like Stanford, MIT, or some of these high powered schools that we think of that all this talent comes from. He went to University of Wisconsin. And not even University of Wisconsin, Madison, which is the main campus. He went to University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And when he, he must have been pretty smart, right, to get a job at Microsoft. But when he, went, when he joined Microsoft, he didn't go into the area, the cash cow business of Microsoft, which is operating system and the Windows software. He picked an area that many people didn't want to go into, which was cloud, com at that time, now we call it cloud computing and machine learning, which is very important today. And then he grew that business, he became very good at it, and at some point they made him the head of that division, cloud computing, where he was only earning millions of dollars. And the, the CEO at that time, Steve Ballmer, said, you know, this could be your last job if you don't make this business grow. And he turned that from millions to billions. And guess what happened in 2014? He became the CEO of Microsoft. And you know, we kind of look alike if I lose like 25 pounds. Really, we do kind of look alike. <laughs> he has like uh, no hair like me and also he has glasses, but he's a little skinnier than me, so I'm working on that. But uh, the point is that after he became the CEO, the Microsoft stock has grown three and a half times when he took over. That's pretty remarkable for a company. And right now, Microsoft is the most valuable company in the world. It's worth more than a trillion dollars. 
But again, it comes down to this. So I'm giving you these big examples, but these are big examples just to illustrate the point that it applies to all of us. We have to solve problems. If, you have, if you're focused on solving problems, then people want you. They're going to recruit you because that's how they're going to grow. Okay? So now we've addressed two things now. Okay, who you are, what you have. Now we're going to get to the third thing. Oh, before I get to the third thing, let me walk you through, because at some point you're going to be in, in an interview where you're going to have to demonstrate how do you actually solve problems. So let me take a little time and explain to you my methodology. Okay? So this is like a real scenario. Let's say I come before you saying, uh, Ms. Khan or Janice, I can solve your problem. The way I would start this is I would say that problem solving is a very critical for company success. That's like level one. That's like given, right? That's a high level statement that I just made. But it's true. If you don't solve problems, companies can't grow. But that's not enough. You can't just say that. You know, you got to show some depth. When you're interviewing for a job, you got to show some depth. And interviews are very important because it, it's very revealing how much depth you can show when you are interviewing. So if I just say, you know, problem solving is, very, is extremely critical for a company's success. And you're like, okay, tell me more, tell me more. So what else? Yeah, I get that. Tell me something I don't know. So then I say, you know, the way I solve problems is there are four ways, there are four things I do. This is my methodology. You gotta define the problem. Because if you don't define the problem, then how can you solve anything? So definition becomes important. Then you gotta structure the problem where you can split it into its component parts and figure out what's important before you can even solve it, right? Because if you don't attack the right problem, then you might be solving the wrong problem, and that's not good. So you gotta structure the problem. Then you can come up with, once you understand what is the thing that you really need to solve, then you can work on the solution, the optimal solution, but that's still not end of it right there because the person who usually solves the problem doesn't have the resources or the political capital. So you still have to sell the solution. So that becomes very important. So that's my methodology. So see, I just went deeper. I just didn't say problem solving is critical to a company's success. I went and told them now that here's how I solve problems. So I just went into details. Then at level three, I can say, but you know, since I'm so good at solving problems, I know what are things you don't want to do, such as people have all kinds of biases. There could be cognitive bias, there could be hierarchy bias, where if the boss says something, everybody just agrees. So there are all these biases you have to avoid. And the other common pitfall when it comes to solving problems is we jump to solutions too quickly. And when you jump to solutions too quickly, that might not be the right solution. So, so now I'm going deeper. Now remember, this is the kind of conversation you want to have. You don't want to be just like uh, be interrogated. You want to have a conversation that shows you that you have breadth and you have depth. You understand what problem solving is all about. So that's why I'm kind of going this into detail. And some of these things like, are like, like now kind of going over your head. Don't worry about it. I'm going to send it to you and you already have it in the handout. So you can kind of create your own uh, way of uh, explaining how you go about solving problems. And then, then after you do that, then the next thing to do at level four is give a simple non-business example. Something that is not business related. So there's a level setting going on that I can apply my problem solving skills not just for business, but also for non-business. So in my case, the example that I would use is just recently, I had a problem in my house. My chimney, chimney started separating from the house. That's a problem. Because if that thing falls, it, well, hopefully nobody gets hurt, but there could be a lot of damage to the house, and that would be very costly. So I had to figure out how do I, I'm not going to bore you with details how I figured it, but there's a lot of work I had to do to solve that problem. Now that you can relate to, because I didn't go into the heavy business stuff. I told her some problem that's affecting me personally, and here the problem, the person that I had to sell the solution was my wife, so that she wouldn't leave me. As it turned out, I did solve it. I had to get a lot of different things done and I had to hire different contractors because there's not a one contractor that you can call and say, hey, my chimney is uh, going to collapse. Can you come in and fix it? There are other things that are dependent on that. So that's sort of like a simple example that I can talk through. You all have that kind of an example that you, have, you can talk about that you have solved, whether it's related to your children, 
related to the, uh, at your house or anything. But after you do that, the next thing, you've got to get into a business-related problem. Okay, because then you have to get to, okay, so you are, we understand you know how to solve problems, we understand this non-business, but give me an example. Now, it doesn't have to be something really difficult, so I'll give you a case in a point uh, with me. So when I was working at Bell Labs, we had a problem. We had a team that was very dysfunctional. Nobody got along with anyone. Everybody was headstrong technically, like, I have a better technical solution than you do, and nobody wanted to budge. And it got to the point where I decided that it was time to leave because we were not making any progress and it was just not fun. But then I said, hey, if I'm going to leave anyway, might as well try something at this point. And I said, you know what we'll do is on Friday for lunch, each person in rotating will pick an ethnic restaurant to go to and we'll just have a lunch together. You know what happened? People started trusting each other. <laughs> we, we went from being dysfunctional to being highly functional team again. And I said, wait a second, you're telling me that did it? But you know, I didn't want to probe too deeply, it worked. So because it worked, it, it worked so well that the head of the team had a uh, fractional ownership of an airplane. And every time we met a milestone, he would take us for a ride. So one time we got a ride around the Manhattan skyline. And when we met the second milestone, he took all of us to Atlantic City. And we went to the White House. That airport that used to be right next to the Atlantic City, it's not there anymore. But at that time, it used to be there. He lands on this little airport. We just walk over. We went to this uh, deli. There's a famous deli there called White House Deli. We had some subs there. And then we went to Trump Plaza, and we played uh, craps or something. And then we got back on the plane, and we came back. So suddenly, going from a team that was dysfunctional, suddenly we're like going on a plane together. That's how trusting we are now. <laughs> so, okay, so, so that gives you, so now you're kind of resonating, like this guy, I mean obviously you don't want to make it as long as I'm making it here, because otherwise <laughs> the interview may be over, but uh, we're all friends here. So then the thing to do is, so now what you've done is you've given them a lot of information that shows you that you really understand problem solving, because remember it's all about problem solving. So then you ask them, how do you solve problems here? So you're engaging them to tell you, you've given me a lot. Now it's time for you to tell me, how do you solve problems here? So you see the kind of conversation, you're getting into a conversational mode. You're not just like, uh, you just, they're not just hitting you with questions and you're answering them. And they're all right answers, right? And then the ultimate question is, what is your biggest problem and how can I solve it? So you see what you've done here? By that last point, if you get to that last point, you've gone from being a candidate to being a team member. Think about that. You went from being a candidate who was looking for a job to being a part of the team. And they haven't even given you an offer yet. So what you've done is, this is the thing, you've told them what you do, you've sold them, and now you close them. So it's, sell, it's tell, sell, close. This is just one example. It could be anything. It could be customer experience, could be relationship building. You've got to be able to walk them from the beginning till the end. And if you do that, you look like the person who's already doing the job. See, one of the things is, interview, when you're in front of people, they're not interviewing you. They're seeing, can I see this person actually doing this job? So an interview really is a proxy for doing your job. If you look like you're interviewing, that doesn't, impress people as much as that, hey, he's already doing the job. I can see him working here. And guess what? The person who looks like he's doing the job gets the job. So what we've been talking about is, I took this three, uh, something from Les Brown, this motivational speaker, and he said that anytime you interact with people, any kind, there are three questions that people are always asking. Who are you? What do you have? And why should I care? So I basically took that and turned it into how would you use that when you are looking for a job. So the first thing is you need a message and a narrative that explains to people who you are. Then, then you need to show that you have skills and how you can, what we just covered, how do you solve problems. That's what you have. And now we're going to address the third thing, why should they care? So at the high level, that's what we've been talking about. So this is very important, packaging. Packaging, right? How many times we buy things because it's well packaged, right? You all buy things that's well packaged. So I'll give you an example. 
Very simple example, and I didn't even realize it till after it happened. So one day I was watching a basketball game, and my wife says, Jay, can you get me some tomatoes? I hated it, but, you know, can't refuse wife when she gives you an order like that. I said, yes, I'll go get it, go to ShopRite and get it right away. So I went and got the tomatoes, and I picked the one that was packaged for tomatoes. But I said, you know, before I left, I took a quick peek at the price, and it was three forty-nine. But then I said, wait a second, let me look some other tomatoes out there. And there were these nice looking red tomatoes, probably Jersey, right? We're famous for tomatoes, Jersey. But it was in a stock. And I said, hmm, $1.49 a pound. Wait a second, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> so I took a plastic bag, put like four or five tomatoes in a stock, and I brought it home. And my wife loved it. And I said, whoa, that was close. She didn't seem to care whether I got the one that was $1.49 or the one that was packaged, she would have accepted either of them. But the one that was $3.49 was very nicely packaged with saran wrap and everything. And then it's when it hit me, I said, wow, this packaging really works, even for somebody who talks about it. <laughs> How important. So this packaging applies when you are looking for a job. You've got to package yourself. So we'll talk about how you do that. So packaging comes down to this thing, right? Like, how do you craft your resume? How do you do phone interviews? How do you do face-to-face -face interviews? And all of it. That's all part of your packaging. Because when you're well packaged, what it shows is you start resonating. They don't have to think too hard. Because when you are well packaged, you're not making the other person think too hard about you. OK? So what I've done here is, in marketing, there's a concept called moments of truth. This is a marketing concept. You don't need to know the details of it. When you send a resume to somebody, that's a zero moment, because they haven't even talked to you. That's the first time they're interacting with you, but you're not even there. So that's the zero moment. So your resume has to basically cannot read like it's some kind of like an RFP response. Your resume has to be hard hitting, because people don't spend a lot of time looking at resumes. They'll take a quick glance at it. If it doesn't look good, then they're going to pass it by. Now, one thing I do want to say, <clears throat> that a lot of people send resumes to a, a website, there you do have to be detailed because that resume is not going to be viewed by a human being. There's going to be a program, computer program, that's going to scan that resume. So that's a different kind of resume. That one, you do want to make it sound like you really have skills, but your skills have to be detailed because that's how they're going to weigh it. That resume then will go to somebody in the human resources. That's the person that will contact you. And when that human resources person contacts you, before you talk to them, send them the updated resume that's for the human being to look at. And that resume that I'm talking about should basically follow the structure that I just showed. That you have a message, there is a narrative, you have skills, you have some big problem that you've solved, and you, you're ready to solve that problem for this company. So your resume shouldn't be really more than a page today because there are things like LinkedIn. If they want the details, they can go to LinkedIn and look at your details. But your resume, if it's three, because here's the thing, when you put three pages, they're not going to look at the three pages. You're going to just confuse them. If they want that level of details, that's what you're there to simplify it for them. That if they're talking to you on the phone, and you can then simplify it. So that's where if you have a message and a narrative, then it's your job to simplify Because otherwise, these pe people don't spend a lot of time looking at anybody's resume. We just don't have that kind of attention span. So keep that in mind. So for example, I was just telling somebody when I gave this talk uh, last week, and this is something I would do, because you've got nothing to lose, right? Let's say you're good in sales. You're good in closing. So you know what I would do? I would put a picture of Tom Brady right in the middle, because he knows how to close on a football field. And you can say, I'm the Tom Brady of closing the sale. Now, I don't know, if you get five resumes you're looking at and one has Tom Brady's picture, that person's going to get called, right? You know, it could be a Beyonce of something. Put Beyonce's picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you have to use your own discretion. I mean, some places, you, this is, okay, a lot of this is like you've got to experiment, right? Because resume is the first time somebody gets to see you. So you can experiment and see what's working and what's not working. You can try your regular resume in one for certain companies, and you may want to try a different resume for different companies and see which one is giving you the best response. So I'm not saying that Tom Brady, putting Tom Brady's picture is going to work. If it's working, then keep using it. 
If you're getting calls saying, hey, by the way, you know, I saw your resume, I'm really like, you're, you, you say you're a Tom Brady of closing the deal, I'd like to know more about it. Then you know it's working. If it's not working, take it out. So that's what I'm trying to say. That uh, you want to be different. Because if all the resumes are looking the same, because I see a lot of resumes, I see a lot of resumes, and I can't make sense out of them. It's too much work. First of all, the fonts are too small. It's just too much work. And I always wonder that if these are going in front of people, remember, packaging, they're making a certain kind of impression with your resume. That if your resume is already that confusing, then they're thinking like, wow, if I hire this person, is he going to be that confusing when I hire him? So your resume has got to be clear. Clarity is very important. Whenever you, in any situation, me giving a presentation, you're looking for a job, or you're networking with somebody, you've got to have clarity. And if your resume has got all kinds of junk in it that's not even relevant, take it out. It's not, a, it's not necessary. If somebody really needs it, you can give it to them later on. You have LinkedIn, but that initial, remember, this is the zero moment we're talking about, right? This is the zero moment right here. We're talking about the zero moment. This is the first time they get to see you without you being even there. What kind of an impression you want to create? Okay, so that's the zero moment. The first moment would be when you get that call from a recruiter. That's the first moment of truth. Because now they looked at your resume, they like something. So the purpose of a resume is really only one thing, somebody to call you. That's it. Don't give them your life history. Don't give them like, you know, I was a straight A student and all that. That's fine, but the purpose of a resume is, can you solve a problem big enough for them to give you a call? If it is, they'll give you a call. Once they give you a call, now with the recruiter, your job is to get to the hiring manager. That's the only job for a recruiter. So you give the recruiter enough to show that you understand the job, you can do the job, and you really want the job. And if you do those three, the recruiter is going to get you to talk to the hiring manager. I've seen it. This is what happens. Because the recruiter man recruiting manager don't give the recruiting, uh, recruiter too much detail. They don't care. All the you're solving the recruiter's problem, which is they found a good candidate that the hiring manager should talk to. That's your job. Once you get that, then you get to the second moment, which is now you're going to talk to the hiring manager by, on the phone, okay, on the phone. And again, here, you want to stay high and only go into details when they follow up. So again, you start with the same thing we discussed. You make sure you initially give your message, your narrative, talk about the skills you have, talk about the problems you've solved, and then let the manager ask you the details. Can you give me specific when you did this? Can you give me more specific? And at some point, the manager is going to validate your background and say, you know, I've heard enough that I want to see whether this person can be part of our future growth story, can be part of the future growth story. That's when you get face-to-face -face interview. Because if the phone interview is to validate your background, say, hey, she sounds good. She looks like she knows what she's doing. I think she could be a good fit. Let's bring this person over and have a much a good conversation whether she fits in part of our growth strategy. And that's when you get a face-to-face -face interview. So the phone interview is very important. And then when you get a face-to-face -face interview, that's where you got to close the deal. Because they're now saying that they're going to invest it, right? Because they're going to have different people interviewing you. So now at, their, at this point, they're investing in talking to you, learning more about you. And that's where you got to be well prepared to close the deal. I always tell people that when you get a face-to-face -face interview, if you think you're a good fit, that you know, then you've got to get the job. That means that you probably didn't prepare well and st stood out, that you should have, OK? So the purpose of all this is you don't want to make the, so the whole packaging part is you don't want the interviewers to think too hard. They're already seeing you. You know, I can see this person doing a good job. I can see the future with this person. And that's what you want to do. So that's the packaging part, OK? Does that make sense? So these are the three questions. So let's say people ask me, like, what are the three questions I should ask? There are a lot of questions. And one of the things I'm trying to do here is try to simplify it. Because interviewing is a very stressful thing. When you're looking for a job, it's very stressful, it's unpredictable, and it can be extremely frustrating. And I just coached an executive who had a big interview uh, yesterday. And I said, 
three questions that I would ask is, why are they hiring? Sounds simple, but it's not. Companies have a reason to hire. Because the kind of job that we're talking about, good, high-paying job, these are strategic positions. Because if, if I need the work done, I can get it done from somebody. Like, I'm getting this videotaped by Michael, but Michael doesn't, I don't employ Michael. You know, he's a good guy, but I don't employ him. Because it's not part of my strategy, right? If I become really big and I'm going around videotaping everybody, then I'll put him on a payroll and say, hey, Michael, you're part of my strategy. I'm going to hire you. Nothing against him, he's a good guy, but you know, that's how business works, right? So keep that in mind. Why are they hiring? And then the other thing is, why are they hiring now? What's the urgency? You know, famous Martin Luther King, urgency of now. What is the urgency of now? Because there's, you're getting to the root of the problem, because they've got to bring you in, because there's a problem so big that, if, that they need it solved by someone like you. And the third question is, why you? What is it they like about your background, about how you conduct yourself, that makes them feel that you are the one that can get the job done? Those three questions give you enough information to have a very good strategic conversation when you go for a face-to-face -face interview. So typically, you want to do this on the phone. This is a question you've got to nail. Everybody always talks about it, like, tell me something about yourself. How would you approach this question? People, you would be surprised how many people can never get these questions right. This, they don't answer this question right. It's not like there's a right answer. So the question was, tell me something about yourself, right? You've been asked that? Yeah. And uh, sometimes that can be a very hard question because you don't know how to really structure that answer. And the way you structure it is you start with your message. Because once you have the message, like let's say I solve problems, let's say that's your message, right? Because that question is not asking about your life story. That question really is three questions into one. Who are you, what you have, and why should I care? That's what they're really asking. When they ask you, tell me something about yourself, that's how you have to structure that, that answer. And who you are, we already covered. That's your message and your narrative. What you have is that I have these skills, and here's what I do with these skills to solve complex business problems, right? And then you can say, I'd like to learn more about uh, this opportunity, where I, how I can add value. Simple, right? It's that simple, but people mess that up. And when you mess that up right from the get-go, you're already starting off on a weak foundation. That's a question, even if they don't ask you, you want to say, well, you know, that's a good question, but before I answer the question you're asking me, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So you want to volunteer and answer that question, because now you are seizing control of the interview. Because if you don't seize control of the interview, you are trying, you, you're going to be jerked around by answering one question after another. So they could ask you, well, so why do you want this job? And you can say, the, number one, the reason is challenge. But before I go into that answer, let me just tell you a little bit about myself so you understand who I am and what, what, I, can, what I have and how I can help you. And then you, fall, then you go right into that, that, uh, that answer. There are multiple ways you can find out. One is that uh, when you're, somebody is going to contact you at some point, they have a job description. So when you get a job description, it usually tells you if the job description is well written, what exactly are they looking for. But then you shouldn't stop there. You should get it validated when you talk to a recruiter. Now, a recruiter can be a hit or miss thing. Sometimes they know it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes when you ask them too many questions, they say, oh, that's something a manager can ans answer for you. So, but that would, that's the best you can do. Look at the job description closely, and then, uh, then try to uh, check with the, the recruiter and see how much information. And it, if you don't know anything, and let's say I'm interviewing with you, and I don't have a clear understanding what the job is all about, I would just start out by saying, you know, before we continue, would it be okay if you can kind of give me an overview of what this job is all about? Because if you continue not knowing it, then you're not going to be focusing on what's important to them. Okay? So, there's a job description, there's a recruiter, and the question you're asking is actually very important. 
at each point you want to know whether all of them are consistent. So if you see a job description that this is what the job's about, you want to make sure that they've actually read their own job description. So if the recruiter tells you something that's not consistent with the job description, then you've got to stop and make sure that there is a consistency between what they've written in the job description and what the recruiter is telling you. Because remember, recruiter is dealing with a lot of candidates. Just ask before you continue. So, that's a, so that I can focus on what's important to you, it would help if you can spend a few, couple of minutes and give me overall on what this job is all about. Because unless you know what the job is all about, I don't know how you can answer questions that would re resonate with them. But another thing to do is you want to help the interviewers help you. By this I mean that at the end of an interview, you have to let them know that you understand the job, you can do the job, and why you want the job. Because here's the thing, at the end, some, that interviewer, let's say it's a recruiter, recruiter's gonna have to talk to the manager. And, they, the, and he or she's gonna have to tell the manager why they should, he, should talk, he or she should talk to you. This is what you want them to get. Simple, one statement, that you really get this job. Why you think you can do the job, give them like three brief statements, and that this person really understands how to help the company grow. So that when that recruiter is talking to the manager, the manager, you're almost feeding the recruiter your talking points. And that's important, people don't do that. And the same thing you also have to do with the manager because that manager is also going to meet with other people and decide whether to bring you in for a face-to-face -face interview. And he may have to go to his boss and say, hey, I like this particular candidate. Why? Because that person really understands the job, can do the job based on the skills and the problem solving that the person has done. And also, that person really wants the job. So it's, it, it, this is up to you to let the, uh, each people, you, everybody you talk to, to help you. Because if you don't do that, then you're kind of leaving it up to them to figure it out. And let, don't let them figure anything out. Well, here's the thing. Let's say we're all working together, uh -huh. and let's say you're the boss. Yeah. You will interview because you're the boss. Yeah. Then you might say that since I report to you, hey, can you also talk to this person? Now, is it like have we sat down and strategized? Like, hey, here, what you're asking is a very tough question yeah. because you're asking that these people should have their act together. No, they just work there. They just work there. They want to know whether you could make a good, uh, whether you would fit in. That's all they're doing. And it's not like they're sitting down together and saying. Here, you ask these questions, you ask these questions. No, I mean, yes. Right, right, and I'm just telling you that there is no such thing as a, you, need a quali you don't need a qualification to interview people. Some companies are very good at this, but from my experience, most of them are not. So when you go and assume that the people that are interviewing really know what they're doing, that would be a wrong assumption. Okay, right, so you know what I'm talking about. That's a wrong assumption. That's why you want to help them. Okay, here's another thing. A lot of times, they haven't even looked at your resume till you show up. Now what do you do? They haven't even looked at, oh, let me see. Oh, you went to this school. Oh, right, you got a very good background. So tell me what you did here. That's not a good interview. So don't assume that the people that are interviewing you know what they're doing, okay? Many times they don't. Because remember one thing, they're busy too. They're busy with their work. They're not spending, like, if you, if you got an interview, you're spending days and days preparing for it. When you get there, they might have half hour with you, and they're just like looking at your resume for the five minutes before they come to see you. Now, how much are they going to get from that? That's why it's important that you control your message and, uh, and, and your narrative and, and all of that, because otherwise what happens is they're not going to be able to figure it out. The burden is on you. So you can't go in with the assumption that the person who's interviewing me is some highly qualified, got a degree in interviewing or something. There's no degree in interviewing. Right? I mean, look, how do we elect presidents? We don't elect presidents like, you don't even have to be qualified to be president, right? There's not like, oh, you have to go to this school and that school, you have to serve in this. No, you just run for the president and if enough people like you, next thing you know, you're the president of the United States. So anyway, let me get to this slide. So this is sort of like a little take on this poker game that you probably have heard of called uh, Texas Hold'em, you know, where they play this poker game. So in a job, it's sort of like that, right? And I call this game that I invented called the Texas show em. So when you go for an interview, you show them all your cards. You don't want to hide anything because you've got all the cards. 
you now, based on what I've covered, you now know this. You have your message and your narrative. That's your ace of spades. Then you have your skills. That's your king of spades. Then you know you have proven track record of solving problems. That's your queen of spades. So as you can see, then you know you understand the problem. Bless you. Then you can solve that problem because you're demonstrating them. And you can't wait to solve the problem because you want to work there. And then the lastly, you can do even more because companies today want more than what you, are, what you have. And, the la and this thing is very important. You're fun to be around, very important. Let me tell you, likability will get you out of a lot of trouble. Give you an example. <laughs> just happened to me just a couple of days ago. I got stopped by a policewoman. Really nice, polite policewoman. She had me cold. She said, you went through a red light. I had to pick up my son from his band competition at 11 o'clock at night, so I must have missed it. Never argue with the police woman. I said, ma'am, I'm very sorry. And then she came back and said, you know, you went through a red light. Second, the registration you have on this is your dad. His license has expired. Why is this? Whose car, whose car is this? I said, my father died a year ago. I have not transferred it to my mother. And also, the insurance card wasn't current. So I had three strikes on me. But I said, you know, I apologize. I know I messed up. I will not do it again. And she let me go. I don't know how likable I was, but it worked. So the thing is, if it worked with this policewoman, it can work at anywhere. So be likable, because likability is one of those superpowers, strengths that you have. Like there is this woman, uh, I don't know if you know her, she, is, uh, she started this company called Spanx. Her name is Sarah Blakely. She's like a billionaire. But the thing about her is she's a very likable person. Like Oprah. Oprah is very likable. That's why she's like worth like zillions of dollars. You can't make zillions of dollars if you're not likable. Right? That's why people watch her. Likeability. Be likable. <laughs> Find out what you have to do to be likable. If it means you have to smile more, smile more, okay? But you've got to be likable because when you're looking for a job, if you're likable, let's say there's a candidate, you're equally competent. One is more likable than the other, the one that's likable gets the job. There's study done on this, and it's fact. I mean, you can look at your own life when you deal with people. You tend to go to lunch with people, you tend to hang around with people that are likable. You can talk to them. You can get along with them. They're not judgmental or anything. So be careful. So this, if you put all this together, you know what you get? Something that I invented. That's a golden flush. Can't beat that. And that's what you want. When you go for an interview, you want to go with the golden flush. Because they can't, there is a, a, there's no other winning card. There's no winning hand. You got the winning hand. So at this point, I have given, I've talked a lot. Now this is where, what do you do next? After this, I've given you who you are, what you have, and why should somebody care. The next thing I suggest you do is make a three-minute video capturing that. You can all do that. You know, we all have this. Make a three-minute video and just say, you know, what is your message? What is your narrative? What are the skills you have? What are the problems you've solved? Do it in three minutes and then your call to action saying, hey, listen, would like to continue this dialogue. Give me a call. And if you're bold enough, put it on YouTube. Send it to people. But, OK, so now that's the good news, right? The bad news is nobody does this. Nobody. I get maybe, one time I gave this talk uh, to 100 senior military officers. Only one person did it. These are senior people, OK? These are people who have been to Af Afghanistan, they're like fixing, flying chopper pilots, you know, pilots and all that. Only one person did it. But the thing is, so I thought, oh, maybe it's these military people. They're just too busy. So I tried with uh, people just like you. And same result. Nobody does this. And here's the thing. This is something you've got to do. Because if you, if you do this, you will know what you sound like. And you will know what you look like when you are delivering your message. You're delivering your narrative. Like, say, I'm getting this videotape, so I'll go through it, and I'll know, oh, Jay, you know, you got to look better next time. Things like that. And you got to do it, because if you're not you're the worst critic, you don't want to find out when you're there in a high-stakes situation 
and then find out that you did not get a job. You gotta eliminate all the things that you should have taken care of. There are certain things you're not gonna be able to control. If there's another candidate that's better than you, you can't control that. But you better control everything you can control. The way you look, the way you sound, the way you deliver your message, you can control that. And you better control that, okay? So this is a three minute video. You can send it to me. If you wanna send it to me, here's what you do. Record it and saying, here are the three things, review it. I want you to evaluate it. I'm not gonna evaluate it for you. Tell me three things you liked about the video that you made. And don't do too many, don't do more than three. Because you write it down and then deliver it. Say, these are the three things I liked about it and these are the three things I need to improve. And here's what I'm gonna to do to improve it. That's all. If you do that, you would be in 1%. Because I just told you, I give this talk and nobody does this. I just gave a talk last week, a week ago, and so far I haven't gotten anything. Okay, so this looks easy, but this is the hardest thing. Because as I said, you took the hardest step coming here. That's the first step. My job here was to get you to take the second step. This is the second step. This is the second step. So either you're gonna stop at the first step or you're gonna get to the second step. And then I said, the third step you're gonna take on your own. And when you take that third step, then good things start happening. Because now, you already know what you have to do. And you're doing it. Now you're improving it. And once you start improving it, you're gonna start winning. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so one of the things I do is, I just wanted to bring this up, it's like a little commercial here. So I coach people, I coach executives. These are people who go for jobs uh, who are like one or two levels below CEO. And I've given you almost, so at this point you say, well, whoa, what have you not given us? I've given you everything. But the thing I cannot give you is that one-on-one -on -one attention. I just can't give that to you. Because that's specific to what you're applying for and the thing that you have to practice. So that thing I just showed you, that video, you'd be re practicing that with me, okay? And since you attend, when people attend, I give them a good discount. Otherwise, typically I charge $4.99. And here's another thing. Today you need a coach because the work is getting so demanding that you need, you need coach because otherwise it's very hard to succeed. And I just recently coached a person who had never been coached before. And people are always thinking like, oh, coach, you need to get, it, you need to get experience what coaching is all about. Because at some point as you're moving up, I'm not saying you need to come right away. When you get a job that you like, that's a good time to get a coach. Because it makes a difference. Because when you go in for an interview, you will be much more confident. Like right now, if you're not sure that you got the message and the narrative and all that, coaching is not the right time right now. But once you start working on it and you're getting some traction from companies saying, hey, Jay, I'm getting this interview from somebody. I need some help so that I can go and stand out. That's the right time to get a coach. And coaching makes a difference. So I just coached a guy, he had a big interview last night uh, with a big financial institution. And he said, Jay, without your coaching, I couldn't have done it. I said, listen, it's execution at the end. I said, I did all the coaching, but at the end you had to execute. I didn't have to execute, I just coached you. But you had to do it when it counted, okay? Oh, and this is something I didn't want Leslie to see it, but <laughs> I want you to do me a favor. But since she's here, I can't now pretend she's not. Uh, drop her an email. And I even wrote it down for you, but so you're gonna have to change some wording here, okay? And I'll read it to you so you can say and see if you agree. Uh, Hi, Leslie. I wanna thank you for the event you scheduled on 917, having Jay Oza giving us a talk on how to get a good high paying job today, okay? Jay's talk was actionable, in, in, inspiring and interesting. He gave us some good ideas on what we can do to stand out at, when we are looking for a job and to get ahead after we land a good job. We would enjoy having Jake give future talks at this library. Again, thanks, and then you can put your name. But she's right here, so you can just tell her. <laughs> now, the reason I put this down is that, that you know, it's, I'm trying to be a little cute here, but the reason is that you've got to remove the hop. Anytime you're interviewing, the more difficult you make it, people won't do it. In any situation, if you ask them, you've got to make it easier for people to do it. So if I want you to send Leslie an email, I'm drafting it for you. Now, if you see it, I obviously I can't send it for you, right? 
But this is an example on what you have to do when you are interviewing. You've got to make it easier. Simplify it, reduce the extra hop that somebody has to take. So if you want to let them know what are the three things they would need to know about you, send it to them. Don't expect them to remember it based on what you covered in the interview. Until you get an offer, you don't have an offer. And everything you do at that point is to get towards that offer. Then you can decide whether you want to do the job, whether you want the job, whether the offer is right. But until you get an offer, you've got to do everything possible to land that job. OK? So at this point, I want to close it out. I want to thank you all for attending. But let me close it out by saying that getting a good high paying job is going to get more and more difficult. Because today, as we all know, gone are the good days where you can land a job and you can pretty much retire. Those days are way gone, unless there are some professions that may still exist. But today, you really don't have one job. You actually have three jobs. And that's what makes it so difficult. That's why coaching becomes so important. As you saw what I covered, getting a job in itself is a job. There's a lot involved here. And I work with people. And a lot of them are just blown away, like, wow, I have to do all this? I said, yes, if you want a job. Because when you're on the outside, you're on the outside. To get in the inside, you have to be that much better to get in the inside. Sometimes you wonder, like, how did that guy get a job? Well, he must have interviewed well. But now, companies cannot tolerate with people that are screw-ups. They're not going to tolerate that. They're going to be found out because companies are getting rid of people if they're not adding value. So when you are looking for a job, especially the kind of job we discussed here, good, high-paying job, you have to be that good. So that in itself becomes a job. So that's one job. Then you get a job. To keep a job is a lot of work. You have to put in a lot of hours to keep that job, to be gainfully employed so that uh, you have that job, to keep the job. So that in itself becomes a job. So that's a second job. And then the third job, when you want to get ahead, there's a lot of work involved. You've got to add more skills. You've got to basically do all this other stuff, like make sure you've got the right access. You're, you, you have access to the right people. They know about you. So getting ahead is another job. So today, you really don't have one job. There are three jobs you have. And you've got to be good at all three of them. And that's why it's so difficult now. And this is something that nobody ever communicates to people. They think, oh, just get a job and everything will be fine. No, you could be let go anytime. There's no guarantee. But at the end, all of these three with a purpose that we talked about called ikigai, the Japanese concept, you will not only enjoy what you're doing, but you'll have a purpose and have a meaning in your life. So it's very important that you give some focus. And I think what I've given you is pretty much fairly comprehensive. Now the thing is, you got to do it. So thank you very much for attending, and now we can uh, open it up for Q&A. If you get a face-to-face -face interview, take it. So just recently, I, had, I, had, I was coaching somebody, and she went for a job that wasn't a fit. And we discussed that. They were looking for a quality management uh, expert, and she wasn't that. She was more of a, like a business analyst, right? But I said, take the interview. Because you know what? By going there, you're going to meet people and if you do a good job and you are very, uh, and do it with integrity and you're sincere, they might see that this job may not be the right, but they might consider you for some other job. So you don't go for your plan A, you go for your plan B. And when I talked to her afterwards, she said, you know, I really executed plan B really well. Now we'll see what happens. And that's exactly. So don't view each job that you have to get. Sometimes the people you know, and if you, like you said, if you go through this uh, plan that we put together on how to interview and you stand out, they will consider you when another position is opening up. It may not help you right away, but down the line, they will consider you. And then it's up to you because they will give you a business card, get on LinkedIn, stay in touch. And you'll never know when it will come back and saying, hey, you know, I interviewed this person a while back and she's keeping me in touch with all the different things they're doing. She's writing this blog, she's done this video. And you have a right to ask them, hey, by the way, you remember I interviewed with you a few months ago? Do you know if anything is? It may not turn up in that company, but they know other people. So one of the things that I want you all to do is, do people that you know, do they know what you really do? Ask yourself. I don't think my kids know what I do. I'm, I mean, my wife probably does now because I keep telling her. But you've got to know, you've got to let people around you know, because if they don't know what you're doing, that's not good. You've got to stop them and say, hey, here's my message, here's what I do. Do you remember that? Because then they're not going to be tell other people. 
So it's very important that everybody you come in contact with, they better know how to represent you. Because they say, no, I know somebody, they were looking for it, hey, you got to talk to this person that I know. That's how, that's called small ties, and they're weak ties. That's how most jobs are gotten, not through strong ties. The person you know may not be able to get you a job, but they know other people that they can inform about you that could lead to a job. So keep that in mind, that you gotta spread the word. That's up to you. People out there don't know you. You gotta make that happen. And if you make that happen, then sooner or later, it's not gonna happen overnight, but over time, it will happen. So now you got the job, and now you wanna get ahead. So one easy way is you have to produce content. So you have to write a blog post or video or something. You gotta be out there. You can do it face to face, but you have a much broader reach if you produce content. Because content, would, you can refer to it, you can send it to people. They would know that you, are, you have insight. So let's say you're in accounting. You can either do accounting work. Now remember, if you want to get ahead, you've got to do more than what other people are doing. So if all you're doing is showing up for work and just doing your accounting work, that's not going to be enough to get ahead you got to take that initiative and in saying, I'm going to write some aspect of accounting that I know about. And you got to take that initiative, something you read or something you're interested in, and you write about that, or you do a video about that, or you can, what I'm doing here, go to the library and give a talk. This con is right there. If you know a topic that you feel really passionate about, you can just contact the library and say, I want to come in and talk about this. That's how you build your that's how you become visible. But you've got to put in the effort. I mean, nobody's going to say, hey, I, I think I know you from doing this. That happens rarely. Nobody out there is thinking about you. As Barack Obama said, you've got to get in face of other people. Remember when he was running for election and he said that you get in front of other people, get in their face and convince them why they should do something. That's exactly, he was right. That's exactly what, how it works. We have to get in face of other people. They're not thinking about us. Once I'm gone, you're not thinking about me. <laughs> so I have to convince you while I am here. Because as soon as I'm gone, you're going to move on to your life. Everything changes, and then life goes on. So if you want somebody to know about you, you got to make it happen. LinkedIn post, yeah, you have a LinkedIn account. So you can just put a LinkedIn post. Because what that does is that now, you can refer to that, you can send it. And you can create a website today, that's not that difficult. So once you have that post on the website, then you can send it, hey, by the way, take a look at this. So I'll tell you something I do. If you go to my website, I read books. And what I do is I will contact the author. So this is just my technique, okay, that I'm gonna share with you. I will contact the author and say, by the way, would you be open to answering five questions? based on the, the book I read. I'll come up with five questions, and I will send it to them. You know, most of the time, they will answer it. And then I'll ask them, can you also recommend five books? Once they send it to me, I'll have like an intro, I'll promote their book and everything, and I will turn it into a blog post. I didn't have to write anything. But you know what? We both got something out of it. I created a content, and they liked it because I promoted them. People like it when you do that. So if you read a book uh, on something, just contact the author and say, hey, by the way, I really liked your book, but I have five questions that I would like to turn it into a blog post. And by the way, while you're doing it, can you also recommend five books that, that influenced your thinking? Take that, put some intro, promote it, say, hey, by the way, I got, because remember, you read the book, that means you already invested a lot of time reading a book. Hey, help them sell more books. So that's what I do. So there are a lot of different things. And then here, I'm here in this library giving a talk. Now, you three may know a lot of big wigs out there. They'll say, hey, you know, you should contact that guy, Jay. You know, I saw him. He's really good. That's how things work. One thing leads to another. That's how it works. And you got to do it. This is work, OK? I'm not going to lie to you and saying, like, oh, this is so easy. This is work. But if you're not willing to do more than somebody else, then why should you get more? That's, that's how it works. So if you got the passion and you got that work ethic and you're willing to put in the effort, then good things will start happening. Because I think, here's another thing I want to tell you about, because 
it's not your competition is not just here or even in America, it's global. And in China, they follow this rule called 996. You know what that means? They work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. And then some people are 997. They work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. That's our competition. They're willing to work hard because they know that if they're not working hard, they're not going anywhere. So that's what we're dealing with. Not only our competition is here, our competition is everywhere. And even worse, there are machines out there that will completely get rid of us because they can do things, if once they start doing things that are cheaper, better, faster, and smarter, they don't need us. So you have to find out, what is it that I do that really adds value, that only I can add value? And there are a lot of things we can do. Ability to take something complex and simplify it, machines can't do that, only you can do that. So if you have that type of uh, skill set where I can take something difficult and simplify it so that people, it starts resonating immediately. Because remember, today we're inundated with all kinds of information. So if that's the only skill you have, that's a very valuable skill to take something so difficult and you simplify it. Because people have no time to, to, to un understand anything. Like how many people even read the Mueller report? It was so well written, very few people read it. So if you have that skill of taking something complex and simplified, that's a great skill to have. That means you gotta put in the work. It may not work the first time, but don't give up. Because this does work. And you know why it works? Because I use it all the time. Like, this presentation for me is just like that. I have to solve your problem. So the way I want you to treat when you're looking for a job, that's how I do it. This is a job for me. I'm here to do a job. And that's how I want you to treat it. Because in the beginning, it'll be a little difficult. It'll be hard because you're doing something that you may not be comfortable with. But that's when you have to do it. You have to get out of that, that comfort zone. I, I think we also sometimes expect too much from our educational system. I think the... The world is changing so fast that educational system cannot keep up with the changes that are happening. I think overall they have a task to just, because sometimes you have to also take charge of how you are getting educated. So the, the resume, when you're writing a resume, what I would do is, is exactly because when I'm trying to get a job like uh, this, is just like you got to have like a, what's your message, right? Because again, if your resume reads like, like something that's not relevant to the job. Because when they're hiring you, they're looking to see how are you going to come in and help them solve a problem, right? The question is, is your resume addressing that right away? I don't need to know how many jobs you had. I need to know what exactly can you do for me? That's what the resume's purpose is. Because when I see a resume, I better want, I want to call you because I see something here that I need. So if you have the job description, then your resume should speak to that. And if it's a good fit, saying, I can do this job, write it just like you're speaking to somebody. Because a lot of these resumes are written, I can't even understand it. Like, they're not talking to a person. They orchestrated this and uh, facilitated this. Those are not the words I use when I talk to people. I only see them on resumes. And I'm not sure those are the right, right words that I would use when, somebody, when I want somebody to read my resume. At the end, another thing you can do is, you can try to be different and put at the end, about me. What makes you so special? You can just put at the end, this is about me. You know, you can have all the other stuff and last thing you can say about me. Here's the thing that makes me special. It could be that uh, you are good at organizing church activities. You're good at volunteering for some organization. So they need to be able to relate to who you are. And if you can do that, all things being equal, that may be the differentiator. But again, all of these things, you have to go with that experiment mindset that there is no one thing that will always work. There's no hard and fast rule I can come in here and say, if you do this, it will work. There's no such thing as that. The only person that is able to answer that is you. And the only way you can answer that is by experimenting. Try this. If it works, great. If it doesn't, try something else. And that's what you have to do. Because that's the only way you're going to know it. Because your experience is a great teacher, by the way. It's not schools. The best way to learn in life is about the experience you have. And if you look at it, if you uh, reflect on it, that has a lot to teach you. Like the speech that I've given, I'll go back and review the video, and that will teach me a lot on how to do it better next time. And that's exactly what you have to do. So 
in football, if I may use a football metaphor, there's a pre-game, then there's game, and then there's post-game. And that's how you have to treat everything. There's a pre-game is how much work you put in ahead of time so that you're well prepared. Then game is when you're in front of in an interview. That's the game time where you may have to change things if something you think is not working. And then comes the post game where you say, OK, I, this is what I did to prepare. Here's how it went. Here's what I need to do better next time. So just treat it like it's, you're playing a game. There's a pre-game, game, and post game. And if you have that type of a mindset in approaching things, it doesn't have to be a job. It could be anything. It could be any meeting you're attending. You're going to prepare. Then you're going to have a meeting. And then you're going to say, OK, what could I have done better to be better prepared for that meeting? These are things that came up that I didn't realize that I needed to know. So just take football, but use it for what you're doing. But education is a, it's an interesting topic. But I have a different views on education. Like I think the important thing is make sure that uh, you're learning skills. Because companies used to be interested a while back where you went to school and all that. Today, I don't think they really are that interested. They, in fact, some school, some of these companies like Google and all of them, I don't even think they care whether you even went to college. They just want to know whether you have the skills that can help them. So everything you learn, find out what is the core skill. Because one of the slides I have, which I'll send it to you, if you put in your email, I will send you my deck along with uh, my ebook that I have written that you can get a lot out of on how to communicate. And, uh, the skill becomes extremely important. How are you learning those skills? So these companies basically want the job done. They don't care what, because uh, you could, I'll give you a perfect example. I just co recently over the last year, was it the beginning of this year, I was coaching a, a student. He had just graduated. He went to NYU. And you're right. And this is a college. NYU is a, is a very expensive college. I think it costs like sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. He did not have interviewing skills. He just did not know, after spending all that money, he did not know how to interview. I kind of felt sorry for him. I said, this is not the skill that the schools are teaching. They teach you a lot of courses, but the fundamental thing you have to do is after you take the courses, you have to be able to show them that you can actually get the job done. And that skill is not being taught. And these kids out there are getting very frustrated after spending all that money, they're not able to get a good job. But you don't need a higher education. You don't need an Ivy League education to stand out in a job interview. You just have to put it all together and convince yourself. So the first person you have to convince is yourself. That's the first thing. You've got to convince yourself that I can do it. If you're not saying it, then you're not doing it. You cannot do it. So you've got to convince yourself. And if you can say it, and then you can do it, then you can convince anybody. So go home tonight and convince yourself. That, you know, I got skills, I got a message, and now I just got to get it out to people so they know about it, whether they like to hear it or not. Because let's face it, nobody else is going to give your message except you. Okay, so if there are no questions, I want to thank you all, and good luck.